Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending today. It's nice to see such a large attendance at 8.30 in the morning, especially near the end of the convention. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the influence of slab openings on the punching shear behavior of reinforced concrete slabs supported on L-shaped columns. And this research is part of an ongoing study being conducted at the University of Waterloo under the supervision of Dr. Maria Anna Polak. So my presentation today has five parts. We'll start with a brief introduction and talk about, you know, the background of punching shear, which I'm sure we're all familiar with present an overview of the study, discuss the finite element model calibration briefly, present the results of what we're calling the aligned column study, and then close with some conclusions before addressing any questions you have. So what is punching shear exactly, as I'm sure we're all aware? Well, it's a brittle failure mode of reinforced concrete slabs, which occurs due to the complicated state of stress at the slab column connections. And punching shear design and research is obviously important because a brittle failure of one connection can cause the progressive collapse of an entire structure, which is obviously something we want to avoid. So even though we have conducted a lot of uh, research related to punching shear, there's still some parameters which we need to study more in depth, and one of those would be the influence of column geometry on punching. One of the reasons why our current knowledge is limited is experimental tests are expensive and require a large facility size in order to test something at scale. And so one way we can supplement this existing database is to use nonlinear finite element analysis. Obviously, we need to calibrate this to existing experimental results, but once calibrated with an experienced practitioner, we can go ahead and get some really important conclusions in a cost-effective way. Uh, so like I said, one of the areas which is really lacking is the influence of column geometry, in particular for special shaped slab column connections, such as L's, T's, and cruciform shaped connections, which all design codes have really include provisions for since the 1970s. But the background of these provisions is relatively unclear, and there doesn't seem to be much work really supporting them. And so we need to evaluate if these provisions are actually accurate or if they need to be modified. In regards to ACI in particular, ACI uses an alternate definition of the column aspect ratio beta for special shape connections. As you can see in the figure in the bottom right here, it defines beta as the ratio of AN over BN, where those are the, ratio, the maximum and minimum dimension of this effective loaded area shown in blue, instead of basing it on the dimensions of the flange. And so we need to verify if that's actually true or should that be modified. In addition, the critical perimeter around special shape connections in all codes doesn't really follow the column perimeter. It is instead constructed to minimize its length, which is logical, but no codes other than really model code and I think the newer draft of Euro code 2 specify a limit on the diagonal portion of this critical perimeter. And depending on your column geometry, you can have a very large unreinforced area, which you're assuming is fully effective. We need to determine if that's an, actual rep an accurate representation or should we be doing something else in these areas. Additionally, in ACI, our opening provisions are, haven't really been changed much since they introduced in the 1970s. The only change we've really made is, you know, we've modified the distance you have to consider openings from 10H to 4H, which is a recent change. But the provisions we have were largely derived from square slab column connection tests, where each side of the connection is relatively equal in transferring load. But how does that work when you have a connection where the, each side isn't carrying the same amount? Typically, you know, we neglect the portion of the critical perimeter bounded by tangential lines to the openings from the column centroid when doing punching shear. But if you have an L-shaped slab column connection, you can have cases where the opening falls very close to the column centroid, and then you need a very large reduction, as you can see in the second figure on the bottom right. Or if your column centroid actually falls within the opening itself, the code really provides no guidance on the required reduction. And so it can be complicated to know what to do in these cases. So in my work today, I'm going to be presenting some results of interior L-shaped slab column connections. And you may ask, well, why would you do interior connections for Ls? They're probably more likely to be used as corners. This is part of an ongoing study of looking at other column geometries as well, including Ts, rectangles, and cruciform connections. And so we wanted to compare all the behaviors of those different connection types. We're looking at, in the paper, two different conditions, one called the unaligned condition and one called the aligned condition. But due to the length of the presentation today, I'm only going to present the results for the aligned condition. And in this condition, that means that for the isolated test, your column centroid is aligned with the slab centroid. And if you translate that up to a continuous slab specimen, that means your column centroid will be aligned with your column grid lines in the continuous structure. And so ideally, you would have no unbalanced moment due to the loading, at least. We considered four different column sizes in our study, and they were all chosen in a way such that the aspect ratio of each individual flange or each rectangular portion of the connection had an aspect ratio greater than two, but according to that alternate definition of the aspect ratio for special shapes, you get an aspect ratio less than two. 
or, yeah, less than two. So you end up getting a higher nominal shear capacity than if you had a, a, a rectangular shape. Our first two column sizes were classified as small columns in this work, and we analyzed opening layouts one through seven. And then our final two column sizes we classified as large columns, and we analyzed opening layouts eight through 11. So that means the study has two main parameters. That would be the column size and then the influence of slab openings. And we looked at multiple locations around the column geometry to see if we could find the ideal location for slab openings around the connections. And also placing the openings in some of them in the regions between the flanges, let us evaluate if the diagonal portion of the critical perimeter is truly effective. If those openings don't have much of an influence, that shows that that diagonal portion isn't having much of an influence. You'll see the specimen naming convention in the bottom left, and if you check out the manuscript, uh, you'll see that it's actually different, and that's because we've updated the one in the presentation to match the larger ongoing study, which has actually recently been published for concentric punching at least. When we started this study years ago, there was no experimental results of special shape slab column connections that we could use for calibration, and so we had to calibrate our model results to the rectangular slab column connection test by Hawkins et al., and we chose those tests because they form the basis of the ACI equation relating uh, punching shear capacity to column aspect ratio. And so it's not a perfect approximation because they're not L-shaped texts, but I think it does give a pretty good representation that the abacus model is capable of calculating punching shear behavior. Since we used abacus, we used the concrete dimensionicity model in order to model the material behavior of the concrete and we calibrated our material parameters through comparisons of the experimental results and the numerical predictions. And based on these comparisons, we found that a dilation angle of 42 degrees and a fracture energy of 80 newtons per meter led to the best agreement between the experiments and the FEA results. As you can see in the table here, the finite element analysis accurately predicts the capacity of the nine specimens with an average under prediction of about 7%. You know, obviously some of the errors are a bit bigger, but overall the, the abacus model is doing quite well. And we also evaluated the load deflection responses and the predicted crack patterns, and as well as the column perimeter shear stress distributions, and found that the abacus results, you know, agreed with other experiments and also the results of Hawkins et al. And so we proceeded with doing the L-shaped column analysis. So getting into the results of the aligned column study, un unsurprisingly, having a slab opening near your connection reduces your connection capacity and stiffness, and that's consistent regardless of your column geometry. The part that's you know, specific to maybe L-shaped columns and other columns like this is the impact wouldn't just be dependent on the opening's distance from the column, but also on its location around the column. If you look at the load deflection graph, you can see there's the red and yellow lines that are labeled as interior openings, and those have openings between the column flanges, and they typically have a relatively small impact on punching capacity, whereas the other openings that are on the outer edges of the connection have a very large impact. And so you can see, depending on where you place the opening, even if it has the same size, you can get vastly different impacts. Looking at the crack pattern restricted by Abacus gives you some insight into where the load is being carried. And you can see that regardless of the column uh, size, that the outer edges are carrying a large portion of the load as there's a significant amount of cracking in those regions. And so that suggests that there's a lot of load being transferred. And based on the cracks being largely parallel to the column faces, it suggests that one-way shear has a large influence, even though these connections all failed in punching. We also found that there are crack concentrations near the short sides of the connection, which are consistent with punching failures of square or rectangular column connections. So there is an influence of two-way shear, but one-way shear is also contributing around these. And if you have a specimen with openings, even though I'm not showing them here, the openings along the outer edges have a more significant impact on the crack patterns as well than openings uh, between the column flanges. We also used Abacus to pull out the column perimeter shear stress distributions, which is a rather uh, post-processing heavy process, but it provides valuable insights. You can see that the column perimeter shear stresses are non-uniform, which was, you know, as expected based on the column geometry, but this confirms that all column sides are not equally effective in transferring load. The highest shear stresses really occur along the outer edges, as you can see, with the inner regions really being relatively ineffective in transferring load. From those shear stress distributions, you can calculate, you know, the total amount of shear force transferred on each face. And we find, again, that the outer edges are transferring a significant portion of the load, regardless of the column size, approximately about 30% of, of the total connection force on each side, whereas the regions between the column flanges are relatively ineffective by comparison. And so this kind of backs up why openings along the outer side have a much larger influence than those located between the column flanges. If you place them between the flanges, you're removing a relatively ineffective portion of the connection. 
So after analyzing the FEA results in detail, we wanted to compare the predictions to those from ACI, and we evaluated two different sets of ACI provisions, the concentric provisions from ACI 318, and then also we used the 421.1R method for connections subjected to shear and moment, because you do have an eccentricity of the critical perimeter centroid and the column perimeter when you have these openings. If you look at the opening impacts, especially for opening layouts one or, you know, a large single opening close to the column, it's found that ACI both methods greatly overpredict the influence of this opening, which shows that ACI isn't really accurately capturing the influence of these openings because it's directly counter, uh, count, contradicting the FEA results and really punishing you for putting an opening where it really should be. In terms of the predicted capacities, the concentric provisions are typically unconservative compared to the FEA on average, particularly for the large column sizes we studied. And this is likely due to the fact that we're neglecting any unbalanced moment due to those eccentricities of the column perimeter centroid. However, ACI 421, on the other hand, leads to relatively accurate predictions for all column sizes, but the method is rather time consuming to apply if you're doing it by hand anyway. So while the ACI 421 method is pretty accurate, it's not really suitable for iterative or preliminary design. And so we decided to look at some simplifications to the concentric provisions we could make. Uh, the first one was, as you can see on the bottom left, would involve neglecting the diagonal portion of the critical perimeter. Based on the FEA results, we found that was pretty ineffective. And then the second modification we looked at would involve redefining the aspect ratio as the maximum aspect ratio of the individual flanges which make up the column. As you can see in the table on the bottom right, both methods, you know, generally improve the agreement between the FEA and ACI predictions, but we recommend neglecting the diagonal portion of the critical perimeter because it seems to best agree with the behavior predicted by Abacus for the L-shaped connections. Uh, so before addressing any questions you guys have, I'd like to just present some conclusions. And firstly, obviously slab openings near our connections do reduce connection capacity and stiffness, and that's probably regardless of your column geometry. But it seems that depending on your column geometry, you can really locate your openings in an ideal location in order to minimize their impact. And for L-shaped connections in particular, it seems that if they're an interior connection, you should place the opening between the flanges. And this is because the majority of your load is transferred along the outer edges. With regards to ACI, it seems that the ACI opening provisions need to be modified. Maybe we need to have specific conditions for different column geometries, because applying something from a square connection to other geometries I don't think is relatively accurate. And also, you know, you do need to use uh, some method of accounting for unbalanced moment if your column and critical perimeter centroids are unaligned. You can use ACI 421 to estimate the concentric punching capacity, but if you're not using software, it is rather time consuming. Uh, so before closing, I'd like to acknowledge those who made this research possible, including the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the University of Waterloo. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have.